Hey there, Tracy from Salem. It's been a minute since I made a video and um, uh, it was a long summer full of lots of stuff, <laughs> um, including kind of progressing on my mental health journey, which which I've been, which has been happening, progression is happening. Um, but I, I just haven't done a lot of videos because I just don't want to talk about it a lot. Um, and, but it's been a kind of a big part of my life, but things are, things are, we're, we're, we've moved down the road. We've taken some steps down that road. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, I did come to talk about this project, which I, um, talked about in my last video when I was making all these hexagon squares and, um, crocheting them together inspired by, um, uh, K3N's cloth tail adventures and also by um, Alexandra in Portugal, uh, Alexandra Almeida. Um, and so I finally, <laughs> man, I, I worked on this thing a lot. And I, I really loved the process of the hexagons. It was very peaceful. It was very hard on my thumb. <laughs> I've, I have, as I've said in many videos, I've got or thumb arthritis, which in that uh, bone at the base of your thumb, which is like the most common arthritis. Um, and I did go on Friday to, well, ostensibly to get another cortisone shot. But by the time I, by the time I finally got the appointment, I was like, no, I'm going to ask for the surgery. And the doctor walked in and said, hey, are you ready for the surgery? So <laughs> we were on the same page um, and that'll be happening in December. Um, because it's just, it's gotten to be too much. Um, but anyway, uh, so, so these little hexes are a little bit hard on the thumb because it's very close stitching, but, and, um, boy, I haven't crocheted in a long time and it was, is some of it's pretty rocky, <laughs> but that's okay. Cause when you put it all together in this bag, um, it, you, you don't really notice, you don't really notice. There's definitely things I would have done differently but that can be, that can all happen after the surgery because crochet is also hard on the thumb. Um, I wasn't really sure what I was gonna make. Um, I thought at first I was just gonna make a, um, a box for, I don't know, material, threads, whatever, um, because uh, I, I didn't plan on making a rice bag because um, I, in the past I've had, uh, you know, back troubles and, um, I really can't wear like th long, thin straps on my shoulders anymore. It's just really not comfortable. And I did think about making these thicker, um, you know, but all kinds of, oh, look at this. It's, this fray is just bothering me. Um, I just wasn't planning on making a rice bag because I just don't find these straps, kind of straps, comfortable anymore. Um, and I also don't like having long straps with a kind of a big bulky bag hitting me in the, <laughs> like hitting my side as I'm walking along. It's just the whole thing. It's not really for me. But at some moment I was like, well, could I put handles in? And if I put handles in, how the heck am I gonna do that? So I will say that a lot of this project, the inside of this project was a lot of construction learning for me and my sewing machine I broke the needle and it's kind of buried and it's not really in a very comfortable place to sit for more than just like zipping a line of stitches and so every stitch in this bag is a hand stitch um and so figuring out how to do all of this just the construction of it I had originally put um um, batting in between each, like kind of a firm, like a pelon between each, uh, in, in, for each square. Um, and I wasn't planning on lining the inside. I just made, I made the front and the back, like I used this on the front and I used this fabric on the back and put the pelon in. Um, but then when I finally had them all crocheted together, I just realized it wasn't going to be, it wasn't going to stand up very firmly. And there's nothing I hate more than when you put your bag on the counter or whatever, and it just flops over. And what I also hate is the root. 
right? When you stand there for five minutes rooting around in your bag looking for your keys or something like that or your pen. Um, I tend to have kind of inserts in my bags anyway because I really, really hate the root. <laughs> um, but I, find, I did realize at some point after I kind of got it constructed and put together that that what I had used between each square was insufficient to keep it upright. And so I was going to have to put in another layer of more firm pellon. And then I was going to need to line it. Um, and so it just became kind of a construction nightmare. And then how was I going to put these guys on? And once these guys were on, how could I still have my, um, the, these little things, what, what do you call these? I don't know, but these little sleeves to have the traditional way of closing your, um, rice bag. So it just all took quite a long time. Finding these was like the key. And I do love the way it came out in the end. It, it opens up to a big roomy bag, but it's actually not that massive when you're carrying it because of the way a rice bag cinches. And so it kind of cinches nicely, um, but ends up being really roomy when you open it. Uh, but my God, it just took forever <laughs> to figure this out. But I, I, I like it and I liked this process. Um, and I... My, my my father said to me, oh my God, when your friends see one, they're all going to want one. And I was like, I am never making this bag again because <laughs> it was so much work. It wouldn't have been so much work if I had a better place for my um, sewing machine and had used that. But it was still a lot of work. Um, this all was a lot of work. But it was a lovely way to spend the summer. So, Yeah. I needed a little bit of a break from kind of a big art piece after doing the sacred geometry piece. Um, and I do have some materials for a next sacred geometry piece, but I'm not doing that yet. This project, excuse my arm, this has been on my mind for over a year. And the problem is I just can't really figure out how to do it is the problem. Um, I have all the materials, um, and I have all the threads and I have beads. I mean, I got everything. I got way more than I actually need. Um, and the problem is that I still just don't really know how to do it. I, I also, I think I was looking at my sketches. I have these sketches. I've been looking at them last night and I think they're just too small. I think it just needs to be a much bigger piece. And so then I have to think about, well, like, so what I didn't think about with the um, sacred geometry piece was how I was going to frame it when it was done. And I have been looking for a floater frame for it. And uh, yeah, the ones I've found are just like they're gold or white or black. And none of those go with the piece. So it just has taught me, think about the end and the framing before you make it. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, that basket's really heavy. So um, since I finished the other piece, I just, I need, I, I just have to have something for my hands to do. And so, um, and it, at the same time, it came when this book came, which probably many of you have also ordered and have and it's an awesome book it is just wow um ecta call she i've been looking at her work on instagram for you know i don't know probably like two years she makes maps a lot which i definitely want to do a map i i just love that idea um but she just came out with this book it's been out i think in europe for a cup or in england at least for probably two months or so uh, but it just came out here in the States. It's awesome. It is such a great book. Um, I'm not going to flip through the whole thing. Um, but she dives deep, not only into the um, tradition of Cantha and the construction of Cantha, but also the history. And then 
also like she she puts in you know stories of her own family her own grandmother her own travels to india um to bengal and um it's it's just quite a book and i've just been reading it very slowly um yeah just definitely and and i'm not that interested in cantha um in in doing cantha myself um it's been a big part of uh, k3n's um uh, i mean uh, she talks about it a lot i should say she talks about you know traditions across across the globe which is just fantastic and introduces us to traditions across the globe which is just awesome um but it's not like i it, i'm not looking to make stuff like this but i find it deeply inspiring to learn about it and to practice this stuff and then see how it fits into my own my own work um so my own work won't look like this but Anyway, I mean, you've seen my work, so you know. <laughs> um, although I would definitely say I am very much still finding my own style. I would say if I have a style that um, that I love, it's that encrusted embroidery, which you've seen on many of my past pieces. Um, but beyond that I am still finding my style but anyway she um so she starts so she has a section in the middle where she teaches you the various stitches um so I've just been going through these now a lot of these I already know and I've known for a long time the running stitch um uh the um double running stitch the back stitch the um, stem stitch, chain stitch, these are all very familiar stitches to folks in the West as well. I was wondering, as I was reading this book, I was wondering, like, when did the, like, have these been familiar stitches in Europe all along? Uh, Europe being where my ancestors came from. Um, or were they imported in as Europeans were, are these stitches that are so familiar to us, you know, in, in America, in England, whatever, did they actually originally come from India and were imported when these Indian, so as she's talking about the history of it, you know, she's talking about Indian textiles being known and valued in Europe way earlier than I would have imagined myself not knowing the history. Um, <clears throat> and so it just makes me wonder, you know, are these all familiar stitches to Europeans because they've been in Europe a long time, but they came from India? I don't know the answer to that. Does anyone know the answer to things like this? I'm not sure. I mean, probably somebody might know the answer to this, like historians, textile historians. I don't know the answer. I don't think I'll ever know the answer. I also think that stitches, like so many things, are the kinds of things that get carried around the world with traders all over the place, right? The Vikings were going from Norway to the Middle East in the 900s, right? This has been, world travel is not a new thing, just whatever the uh, cruise lines might care to tell us. It is a long established thing. Um, and so everything that a culture has travels with it as it uh, either migrates, immigrates, or travels, or conquers, or whatever. All of these things that have been happening in the world for a very long time. So, so I don't know the answers, but I was curious about that because a lot of these stitches, um, herringbone, cross stitch, you know, these are very familiar. Then she gets into some of these pattern making stitches which are very cool um and you know which we've seen from some uh like I learned this kind of thing when I took uh, a class with uh, Julie Booth um but you also see uh um oh gosh spirit cloth Jude Hill doing stuff like this all the time these circular patterns um uh, Miriam Gale, uh, I'm going to say her last name incorrectly. I'm so sorry. 
Galen or Galen or Jalen. I'm not sure. It's a Dutch name. Um, but she <clears throat> does uh, something that's like similar to this as she goes and she goes out and makes all these kind of organic shapes. Um, so anyway, great book. I started working my way through it. Um, even though I already know a lot of these beginning stitches, I'm really looking forward to, uh, this one, um, that can, can, that can create all these different kinds, um, of stitches. So, you know, maybe I'll hop back on the screen at some point, uh, or maybe you'll just buy the book yourself. Um, but I, but this is what I've been working on. This is a sampler that I've been working on, um, inspired from a variety of places. Now, I'm already going to forgotten the name of one of the people that inspired me on this, so I'm going to look it up really quickly um, and see. Uh, sorry for this. This is going to take a minute. Sorry. Um, what is her name? It's, I think it's Tamiko. I'm looking right now, but of course the internet is not being my friend. Um, oh, sorry, Tomami, Tomami Mimura. So there's a couple things happening here. There is this, which was inspired by um, K3N's um, little, uh, her, her week on molas. Uh, you know, it like, I didn't do some of the things that I wanted to be able to do. And I, I watched a bunch of videos afterwards, kind of try, but I really couldn't find anything that really gave you a close up, step by step, how to do it with a couple of different, um, it's, it, it's, it, it's not so hard to figure out with one piece of fabric. But with two pieces of fabric, I, I had a tough time finding a video that could really show me up close how to do it. So I didn't do some of the things that I wanted to do because I couldn't figure out how to do it. But this is what I did, the turtle shell. Um, I had this green fabric and this um, blue. Um, I forget what you call it when they put the, when you put the resist Anyway, um, and then, uh, you know, a lot of the edges were not great. Uh, let's see. I did not do a, a good job, so they're kind of fraying or whatever. Um, I have a lot to learn. But then I, so then what I did was I did this embroidery coral stitch to kind of <laughs> cover the edges where I didn't do such a great job. Um, and then this, um, which is essentially needle weaving, um, but I had been watching some work by a Japanese uh, woman who makes like little animals um, using what, what I call needle weaving, um, Tomami Mimura, and she makes these delightful little um, animals. All, through, all from needle weaving. And I was just like, oh, you know, I love needle weaving, but I never do it. And um, and I just wanna. <laughs> I, so I just got like all kinds of leftover bits of yarn from when I used to knit. Uh, I just have like all kinds of tiny little, weensy little leftover balls um, because I can't knit anymore because of my thumb. Um, and so, I was like, let me just, let me just try this needle weaving. Um, and I actually ended up uh, ordering her first book in English. She's published a bunch of books in Japanese, but she just published something in English. So that'll be a long sometime. I just ordered the digital version. Um, not because I want to make little tiny animals, but I just want to, like, she needle weaves so perfectly. And so just wanted some tips and tricks. But I just tried a bunch of different, um, and she does it in a very interesting way, a way that I really 
like in that she doesn't just put all the warp stitches and then weave the weft stitches. She puts like a warp stitch, a weft stitch, and maybe three, and then she goes back to the warp, and then she goes back to the weft, and it actually just makes it much more interesting. <laughs> so down the road, maybe I'll do a little video on that as well. And then I just started going through my Cantha book um, and uh, just trying out the various stitches. So I'm gonna zoom in because I'm doing it all in dark blue. And so it's very hard to see on the camera. Um, but I just started with like the regular running stitch. And then this is the darning stitch, which I'm, let me show that to you. Uh, which I actually have never done this one. Okay, zoom out a little bit, Tracy, so that people can see. But you see, you just pick up one thread. Now you have to zoom in a little more. You just pick up like one thread and it creates this look. And so I really actually like the look of that a lot more than the running stitch. Um, I never, you know, I don't, I can't do the running stitch very evenly. Um, I mean, here it's around a curve, so it's, it's harder to do, but I don't really do it very evenly. Um, and not that you have to, not, not at all. But I just, I don't, I don't generally enjoy the way it looks the way I do it. Um, but um, I really like this darning stitch. I love the way that came out. Um, and then was, um, uh, what's the next one that she does, which is the, not back stitch, but the double, double, double running stitch. So you do your first row of running stitch and then when you get to the end, you go back and fill in the empty spots. So I did one where I just did it in one color and then another where I tried a two color version, which I don't like at all, but it's probably because I just don't like that green, but I don't like, I'm not a fan of that. Um, then I did the, this is the back stitch, and this is the stem stitch. And now this, this thing, oy, where is it? The cable stitch, so, okay, so sorry. So, so first you do the chain stitch and then you do the cable chain or the cable stitch, which is a version of the chain which has like a, a knot in it. Let me zoom out a little bit. You like put a knot on the thing, then you do the chain then you put a knot on the thing and you do the chain and mine doesn't look anything like that. <laughs> um, I, and I, I practiced it a couple, I did each, each stitch like three rows, um, to try to, you know, to just kind of get a rhythm going. Um, and the, this one, it's like the chains, some of them are like twisted and flopping and it's very hard to see, uh, like clear, um, these, see, these are all, these are the, let's see, these are the first attempts here and the t chains are all twisted. You know, it's getting a little better here, but it is not an easy stitch. No, sir. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And so now I'm working on the fly. So, so that's what I'm doing. So I'm just going to fill this whole thing up with various Cantha stitches, um, and I look forward to trying that one that I showed you where it was like fat and thin stitches, which is just basically a mixture of the running stitch and the chain stitch, but you're putting the chain in certain patterns, um, detached chain. Um, so I hopefully kind of like a whole side, I'll, I'll figure out a pattern and do like a whole side in it. But yeah, I'm just working on this sampler basically of just a variety of different things to uh, keep myself from being, it, it's, it's, I really like doing stitching. I get very itchy in my hands if I haven't stitched for a bit. And so I, in between big projects, I will just do stuff like this where I try out a bunch of 
different techniques. So hopefully, uh, maybe you got some inspiration here from uh, some some things you can try here. Um, definitely check out this Cantha book. Um, and if you haven't tried uh, this technique of making squares and then attaching them by crochet, uh, yeah, definitely give that a try as well. So, all right, uh, hopefully I'll get in one or two more videos before I have to have my surgery because then I won't be able to do anything for however many weeks, like probably about six or eight weeks, I probably won't be able to stitch, maybe a little more than that, um, depending on how I take to the surgery. Uh, it's advanced a lot. It's a highly successful surgery, like 98% success. Um, and I was watching videos of people who've had it from a couple of years ago, and they were they were saying basically like within six months, they were, uh, you know, basically completely, you know, no pain and um, could do everything they wanted to be able to do. And, you know, this is three years later. It's, it's amazing how fast um, things advance. Uh, so I'm hoping maybe it's, it'll only be a couple of months, but you know what I'm going to be doing? I'm going to be practicing stitching with my left hand. That's what I'm going to be doing because there's no way I'm not stitching for three months. All right. Well, thanks for hanging out. I hope you're doing well, and I hope that you are stitching on something that you love.